Chapter 17 Bill Wap Imsgnis Gantz The dogs did bark, the children screamed. Up flew the windows all, and every soul bawled out, Well done! as loud as he could bawl. William Cowper, The History of John Gilpin Funny thing, I played in the big leagues for 13 years, 1914 through 1926, and the only thing anybody seems to remember is that at once I made an unassisted triple play in a World Series. Many didn't don't even remember the team I was on or the position I played or, or anything. Just Wams Gant's unassisted triple play. Actually, more people probably know me as Bill Wamby than as Bill Wams Gant. Wamby fits in in a box score easier, so that's how it usually it was reported. But it doesn't matter. Same thing. Wamby, unassisted triple play. You'd think I was born in the day before and died the day after. Fact is, I was born in 1894, 26 years before that play, and now it's 45 years after it. And knock on wood, far as I could, far as I know, I'm still bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. I was born right here in Cleveland, Ohio, although I grew up in Fort Wayne, Indiana. You see, my dad was a Lutheran and clergyman. And in 1895, when I was I was only about a year and a half, half old, he was transferred from Cleveland to a church in Fort Wayne. Naturally, it was assumed that I'd follow in his footsteps. That was just taken for granted, that someday I'd be a minister too. Same as Dad, I even believed it, w it myself for a long time. In those days, you know, the old-fashioned Lutherans thought that you had, had to do that all you had to do was bring your boy up that up the right way, and the Lord would take care of the rest. High persuasion, you might say, especially if you were a minister's son. And of course, I accepted this. Everything seemed like it was, was all sort of a cut and dried as far as my future was was concerned. Then it happened. I went to Concordia College in Fort Wayne and played ball on the a college team. And the, it started me to think that maybe I'd better reconsider the whole thing. First place, once I got to the plane on the college team, all I did was sit in the classroom and look out the window, wishing that class was over so I could go out and play baseball. Then in the second place, about becoming a minister. Well, I just couldn't figure out how I could possibly do it. The trouble was I couldn't and talk in front of people, public speaking in front of a group of a of people. I mean, I simply couldn't do it. I was a pretty bashful youngster and, was, and I stuttered a bit. And I still remember one day I got up to make a, a recitation and in class and I couldn't get a word out, not a single word. So I got to worrying about how to get out of the whole situation. There was my father, although, and he was expected of me. I just dreaded telling him I didn't want to be a minister. Even now, I get nervous and when I think about it. So I just kept right on wadding through the whole business. I finished the college, and after that, you were supposed to go to the theological seminary down in St. Louis, Missouri, for a couple years. So that's what I did. I went to Divinity School in St. Louis, even though I still couldn't speak in front of people without working up a terrible case of stage fright at every single time. Unfortunately, nobody would there was willing to take the bull by the horns and say right out that this kid just wouldn't take make a good minister. So I went on through. It's just a joke, but I did. What happened while I was there, though, was a pure stroke of luck. The, Lord, the good Lord must have really taken in pity of me. One of the other seminary students had played some professional baseball, and by sheer chance, the manager of the Cedar Rapids Club wrote to him and asked him if he knew a good shortstop he could recommend. Well, he recommended me, of all people. So during the summer vacation from the seminary, I went and played ball. That's how I got my start. 1913, the Cedar Rapids Central Association Professional Baseball. In Iowa, of all places. Of course, first I went home and talked to my father about it. I told him it was just for the summer, so he let me go. I joined Cedar Rapids at the beginning of July and played there all summer. Then I went back to the seminary that fall. They often have opportunities for the students to go on and get practical experience in the ministry and related 
it feels, you know. Well, it happened there was an opening in North Dakota for a man to teach school until Easter. This was just exactly what I wanted. I went up there and taught school in North Dakota until Easter, after which I was free. And since that was just about the time the baseball season started, so I went from North Dakota right back to Cedar Rapids to play ball again. I had a very good season at Cedar Rapids in 1914. Speaking of, and before it was the over, they sold me to the Cleveland Club for $1,250. Speaking of money, by the way, my salary with Cedar Rapids was $100 a month. It was more when I joined Cleveland, but not a heck of a lot more. There was no such thing as minimum salary in the big leagues back then, like there is now. In those days, minimum, it was minimum, you might say. Now being sold to Cleveland, the moment was of trial by fire had really arrived i had to go back to and straighten all this out with my father which i did i took a deep breath and told him father i didn't i would want to be become a minister that i that i didn't think i was equal to the task and i always had an ambitions to become a professional ball player and then i knew i had talent and at least it looked that that way, because Cleveland had bought me. Well, Dad really amazed me. The biggest surprise of my life. He agreed to let me do whatever I, I thought best. Didn't argue much at all, and said whatever I wanted to do was fine with him, which was a very bad, big thing when you think about it. I'll tell you one thing. It surely took a burden of my mind. I felt as though a thousand ton load had been and taken off my back. Actually, the fact is, I have, sn- I have a sneaking feeling that uh, what it really did... What really did it was that I was going to play for Cleveland. Dad had always has been a Cleveland fan, especially for Larry Lahoey. He, I'm still not sure what he would have said if I had been sold to the Detroit Tigers. So, I joined the Cleveland Indians as a shortstop in August of that year, 1914. My second year in organized ball. Actually, they were called the Cleveland Naps back then after Napoleon Lahoey. We became the Indians the next year after Lahoe left. We didn't have a very good club that year. I think we ended last, to tell the truth, but we added some awfully good players. Shoeless Joe Jackson was there at the time. Of course, he was well known for and with his years with the Chicago White Sox. Ray Chapman at shortstop, Jack Graney in left field, Steve O'Neill catching, and Terry Turner at third base. Terry Turner had been playing in the Cleveland infield since 1904, and of course, Lowe was the was still there at second base. That was his last year in Cleveland, and it turned out I was his successor at second. As I mentioned, Ray Chapman was the regular shortstop when I got there, a great one too. Ring Lardner was writing sports in those days, and he must have gotten intrigued by my name. He wasn't the first nor the last. I hardly joined the team when I before I read this limerick in the newspaper. The Naps bought a shortstop from named Wums Gantz, who was slated to fill Ray Chapman's pants. But when he w- he saw Ray, and he could, the way he could play, he muttered, I haven't had a clam's chance. And it was true enough, and although I had been a shortstop in the minors, they tried experimenting in with me at second and third. One of the first games I got in was a game versus the Detroit Tigers. I was put in at third base. I hadn't been on the club more than a week or so, and the Tigers tried to rattle me by yelling insults of one sort of another at me. See, their bench was the right next to third base, maybe only 15 or 20 feet away. While all those guys yelling at me while I'm in the field, I looked over at them to see what all the excitement was about. And darned if Ty Cobb wasn't yelling louder than all the of them put together. Gee, I thought to myself, that's funny, a star like Ty Cobb picking on a raw rookie like me? So he yelled back at him something like, If you think I'm such a busher, you ought to see yourself. It's a peculiar thing. I'd get so nervous. <laughs> I couldn't even talk in front of people. But I was nervous a bit. Never a bit nervous out there on the ball field. Not and even with 50,000 people in the stands. And those guys did it by yelling at me and was making me mad. In the first, in, in the first inning, excuse me, 
And Ty Cobb came up to bat. Well, before the game started, Terry Turner, who had been in the league a long time, told me to watch for, told me who to watch for. He said that Cobb was a very good bunter, and that I had better be on on the alert for a bunt down to third base whenever Cobb was up there, there at the plate. However, Turner said to me, "I'll give you a tip. If he's going to bunt, he'll grit his teeth. He'll grit his teeth like he's going to murder the ball, and that's when he'll bunt." He does that to bar- to throw you off, see? So Cobb came up to bat, and I'm watching him real close for this grit- teeth-gritting business. Since he was a left-handed batter, I couldn't see his face real good. I could see his face real good, excuse me. By golly darn, if all of a sudden he didn't start gritting those teeth to beat the band looking in as fierce as Me- Mephistopheles himself. Here it comes, I thought, a bunt. And I started creeping in even before the pitcher let the ball go. By the time he got the pitch got to the plate, I was halfway in. Crack! Cobb swung with all his might and slammed one down at me in a mile a minute. It's so hard, I thought it would it'd take me my head right off my shoulders. I threw up my hand to protect myself, and by sheer accident, the ball stuck right in my glove. After that, I, th- I let Terry Turner keep it, his advice to himself. Finally, after a lot of scuffling around, they settled on second base as my position. I played second alongside Ray Chapman at shortstop for six years. He was one of my best friends, and we got to, uh, so we worked together like clockwork in, in the field. Ray always said he would never play a shortstop next to anybody else, and sadly enough, that was the true. That was true. He was hit in the head by a pit etched ball and killed in 1920. That was a terrible thing to happen. Ray Chappie was probably the most popular man on the team. As a matter of fact, he talked of retiring after that season. His wife was pregnant at the time, and his father-in-law, that was a millionaire, was going to set him up in business. It was an awful tragedy. Such a sweet guy. We slumped very badly after that. It happened in the middle of August, and we went to a tailspin after a while. But as you know, we eventually recovered and went and on to win the pennant and beat Brooklyn in the World Series. Trish Speaker was our manager, and center fielder or Joe Sewell took Chappie's place, and we had really good pitching. Stan Kovaleski, the great spitball pitcher, you, bu- you probably might remember him from an old chapter. Jim Bag- Egby and Ray Caldwell. Of course, that was the World Series where I made that unassisted triple play. It happened this way. It was the fifth game of the series, and we were tied with the Dodgers at two games apiece. The date was Sunday, October 10th, 1920. We jumped out to an early lead when Elmer Smith hit the first Grand Slam home run ever hit in a World Series and at the end of the fourth inning, we were or way ahead 7 nothing. First man up for Brooklyn in the top of the fifth inning was their, first, was their second baseman, Pete Kilbuff. He singled to left. Otto Miller, their catcher, singled to center. So there were men on first and second, and no one out. Clarence Mitchell, the Brooklyn pitcher, was the next batter. Well, in a situation like that, with him and being behind... And by seven runs, we didn't expect them to butt or hit or run or anything. We figured they'd just just hit away. Mitchell was a pretty good hitter, and being a left-handed batter, he generally pulled the ball all to right field. So with all that in mind, I tried to play deeper for him, not especially caring whether he got a double play or not. Not playing close for that. We didn't need a double play just stop the rally that would it be enough so i played way back on the grass well jim bagby was pitching for us and he served up a, a fastball that mitchell smacked on his rising line toward or center field a little over to my right that is to my second base side i made an, an instinctive running leap for the ball and just barely managed to jump enough to catch it in my glove hand and one out that impetus of my run and leap carried me toward second base and as I it would continue to second I saw Pete Kilduff 
still running toward third. He thought it was sure or hitsy and was on his way. There I was with my the ball in my glove and him and with his back to me. So I just kept on going and touched second base with my my toe two out. And looked to my left. Well, Otto Miller from first base was just standing there with his mouth open. No one even, no more than a few feet away from me. I simply took a step or two over and touched him slightly on the right shoulder. And that was it. Three outs. And I started running into the dugout. I knew exactly what had happened. The reason I did it is that just a few years before, I joined the club another cle. Cleveland player near O Ball had done the same thing in a regular season game against the Boston Red Sox. He had made the first unassisted triple play in a big league history, and many of the few, of the fellows on the club knew Neil and talked about the play a lot, so it was familiar to me. However, it took place is so suddenly that almost most of the fans didn't know what had happened. So uh, they had to stop and figure out uh, just how many outs there were. So there were a dead silence for a few seconds. Then as I approached the dugout, it began to dawn on them what they had, had just seen. And they were cheering, started, and quickly got louder and louder and louder. By the time I got to the bench, it was a bedlam. Straw hats flying out onto the field. People yelling themselves hoarse. My teammates pounding me on the back how did it feel bill oh they all wanted to know well that's how it felt pretty exciting and pretty wonderful i guess that's still the only unassisted triple play in world series history there have been a few since in regular games i think the last one was in 1927 the rarest play in baseball they say i'm still very proud of it that happened in 1920 but baseball is a game of, of ups and downs Three years later, on Christmas Eve, 1923, I was traded to Boston. We had just bought this very house with my wife, who was pregnant at the time. We moved here in December and had no more than I had gotten settled before we got the news. Traded to the Red Sox. I'd been with the Cleveland Indians for 10 years and like the town. I like the town, but you simply have to expect that in baseball, I guess. No choice. That's the way it is. That's all. Being traded was a shock, but not near as much as when I, I started to realize that I was thrilled. That was almost m- impossible to accept. My last year in the big leagues was 1926. I was only 32. I just couldn't adjust to not playing ball anymore, so I went back to the minors and played there. M- managed some there, too. My last year in professional ball was 1932. I was 38 years old. I was the middle of the the depression, the Great Depression. Opportunities for scouting and managing just ceased to exist, and other jobs were e- even scarier. So I worked a- around odds and ends, managed a girls' softball team for four years, and this and and that I f- until I finally got straightened out. Having to leave the game is a very difficult adjustment to make. That goes for every single ball player. Don't let any any one of them tell you different. So there are highs and lows in a baseball career. It has its glories and it also has its sorrows. You know, one day when I was playing with Cleveland, we were in New York playing the Yankees. I was on the elevated train going to up, up to the Polo Grounds, which is where the Yankees is were at, at the time before Yankee Stadium and was built. And I was reading the paper on the the way I came across a poem in that paper. Before I got to 155th Street, it cut out and put it in my wallet. Or I cut it out and put it in my wallet. That poem stayed there in my wallet until it disintegrated by then. It didn't matter because I memorized every line of it. I don't remember or who wrote it, and I don't remember the name of the poem. But I do remember every word in this, every single line of it. It went like this. Now summer goes, and tomorrow snows will soon be deep in the sky of blue, which summer is new, sea shadows creep. As the gleam tonight, which is silver bright, spans ghostly forms the winds rush by with a warning cry of coming storms. 
So the laurel fades on the snow-swept glades of flying years in the dreams of youth. Find the truth, the better truth of pain and tears. Through the cheering mass, let the victors pass to find fate's thrust. As tomorrow's fame writes another name on drifting dust.